Okay, welcome to the 13th common session of Synoikis Digital Classics 2017. Today we have again a session about name entity extraction. This is the second session about this topic with uh, Francesco Mambrini and Matteo Romanello from the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin. They presented a few weeks ago about this topic and now we have a second session, a continuation about the session today. And as you know, you have uh, the outline in GitHub with everything, the slides, uh, links, uh, and an explanation and also exercises. So, Matteo and Francesco, welcome again and thank you for contributing to uh, Synoikisis. And I think that Matteo is going to start. Yes. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. You should okay. see the, sli the slides now. Yes, it works. Okay. Great. So, first, first of all, thanks for the, for the introduction. Uh, it's glad to be back um, with the second session. So, this is a brief outline of today. Um, we are going to do a quite quick recap of the main concepts of programming in Python. This will be done by Francesco, and he will also add a couple of concepts. Um, then we will go back to the named entities that we extracted the last time. Uh, from Caesar's uh, the Bello Gallico, and we will see how we can compute and also plot some basic statistics about the extracted named entities. Um, then Francesco will move to uh, extracting dates, so a new specific type of named entities from uh, journal articles in classics and archaeology using regular expressions. Um, and then I will take it back to go a bit into the evaluation of named entity recognition, um, explaining what are the error types um, that one needs to, to capture and how do we actually measure uh, the accuracy um, of, the, of the output of a named entity recognition system. So, Francesco. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matteo. Now let me uh, share my screen. Okay. All right, you should see my, my screen. As usual, as we did last time, uh, you will find in the links that are uh, circulated the, um, um, the hyperlinks to the uh, uh, IPython notebooks where you can find the code and you can follow along if you want or whenever you are reviewing this lecture you can uh, uh, you can play with our code and try to um, and try the, the little bits of code that we are um, discussing in this common session uh, like last time we will ask you to make a copy of uh, of, um, of the, the, the notebook that you want to play with and uh, append the last two letters of, for example, modify the title of the, of the notebook but with, the, with some uh, identification of yourself, like two last, the, the first letter of your uh, name and surname or something like that. So, as Matteo announced, the first part of this lecture would be, uh, of this uh, common session, would be some sort of recap of what we said last time. Remember that we uh, try to provide to you an introduction on uh, the topic of uh, name identity recognition and extraction, the topic that is typical of um, computational, um, computational linguistics and text processing. So the task of identifying um, names like persons, places, organizations, and so on. We'll see uh, some example later on. Um, and at the same time, how to do this kind of things with, uh, uh, with Python, with the program language in Python, which is extremely popular right now because it's a, uh, easier to, uh, to understand and to uh, jump into, for even for people that are completely new, for people who, has never, who have never um, tried programming before, and at the same time it's extremely powerful, so it allows you, uh, and it has a lot of, uh, of code already developed by, by other people to, to perform some, I mean, some um, natural language processing. So, first thing that we do is a little bit of a summary of what we, of we, have, of what we have already seen, what we have already done. Um, in the previous common session, um, we have introduced some, some of the fundamental notions of the Python language. And remember that our, uh, our goal is not to teach you how to program in Python properly, but yeah, we will show you some rope on how to do some things 
which are already extremely interesting and are extremely advanced that can help you uh, with, with your uh, daily life in digital humanities. Uh, it would be a sort of a gentle introduction if you want to know more. And at the same time, it will help you to uh, understand pretty much what's go what goes on in other people's code. So if you go around, if you Google around, uh, and you find some, uh, some scripts, and if a friend of yours passes you a script that does something, you can look at this code and understand what's going on. So uh, very, very quickly, what did we see last time? Uh, we mentioned the fact that uh, Python has a lot of libraries that come with uh, already with the defined functions that you can already find. Most of the time, this will be enough uh, for you to start, and your problems will be already solved by someone else. And this is uh, here. It's uh, in, in this cell you find how to uh, import these bits of codes that you hopefully have already installed in your computer into the. Um, into the into into your your scripts and your programs. So uh, this is the way uh, you can either import the whole module or from a module import a specific object, specific classes, or specific functions uh, with this kind of syntax, uh, as Matteo has showed you last time. We discussed, of course, about the data types in in Python. So the fact that there are integers and floats, string uh, of texts, and booleans like true or false. It can only have the value true or false. We talked about data collections, like lists, uh, collection of values that can also have multiple uh, in different da data uh, types. This is typical of Python. Uh, tuples, which are like lists, but immutable, so you can modify them. Dictionaries, which are pairs of key and values. Uh, we saw briefly what for loops and if statements does, like for loops that let you iterate over iterable items like lists. Like in this case, for example, let me show you. Let's run some bit of a code. In this case, well, okay, you got an assignment here. Try to figure out what this line, line number three does, not line number two. And, but in any case, uh, in any case, um, this will, uh, will print, this, this code here over here will just print the content of this list. Uh, we saw function, how to define function with the dev statement and just remember as I, said last time uh, to be extremely careful of the indentation in Python because the indentation is what tells to the Python interpreter that some of your statements, some of part of your codes are within a uh, statement. So if I don't put the indentation here, this is a, this is a incorrect and uh, anyway because it is interpreted as if it just wasn't in uh, within this function. But in this case, You've got this funct, very simple function that you pass a parameter to, and it just just print whatever you pass to it. Uh, then how to uh, what to do when you meet with errors when you with part of your send, of your of your code doesn't make any sense and generates error, and how you can uh, catch and uh, handle this kind of of uh, exceptions. Right now, I would like to add a bonus uh, for you. So a part of again something about the Python syntax. Uh, which is certainly not intended out, uh, to teach you how to program, but again, how to uh, look around at other people's code. Because if you, for example, look at one of the libraries that we mentioned many times, the NLTK, Natural Language Toolkit, uh, and you want to uh, have a look at what uh, of some of these modules in this library, that, so they, they are defined, you will find this kind of syntax which you won't understand, uh, given the notions that, I have, uh, that, that we discussed last time. And the notion is that of objects and classes. Objects are generally considered particularly complicated by people who start uh, to approach a programming language, uh, especially language, uh, an object-oriented uh, programming languages like Python. Um, but uh, they shouldn't be. So let's, let's try to see in the, the very in the most basic and stupid way what objects and classes are in Python. Well, if you ask me, the way I typically think about objects in, uh, uh, in programming languages is like magical animated tools, right? What do I mean? Uh, for example, let's say that you've got a, a task, whatever task. Imagine that you are writing a program to solve a task. Like, for example, you want to go and fetch water from a well and maybe also clean some of the mess that you generate while you do this process. Uh, well, a way to approach this in an object-oriented mindset would be to create some sort of a, your magic brooms, like Mickey Mouse in Fantasia, and uh, instruct them that magic brooms that 
go and fetch the water for you and instruct them to go and fetch the water for you while you sit and watch these brooms do their magic. Uh, so if you have this kind of approach, yes, um, and you want to create these brooms, then you must visualize them, conceptualize them, these brooms, in terms of the special features that they have, so some peculiar features that these magic brooms must have in order to be magic brooms, and the actions that they can execute, like, for example, fetch water, clean the floor, and something like that. That's it. So that's what uh, that's exactly the same thing as you should imagine classes and objects in uh, in Python, for example. Uh, in the, the lingo of programming, features are called the properties of the objects, and the actions are called the methods. Right. So if you want to build your your brooms, the first thing you do is create your prototype, the class, which is called class in uh, in, in in coding. And then you can go on and in your code create as magic, uh, use these, these blueprints to create as, magi as many magic brooms as you want. Here's how you do that in, uh, in Python. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Um, here's how you do that in, uh, in, oops, in Python. Uh, the, 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 the specific definition that it's here is from line three to line six is what it's called a constructor of a class where you pass uh, a, a property that you, when you generate these brooms, like for example, a name <laughs> to these brooms, and then uh, you define the properties of this broom. And then you define the methods, so what these, people, what these magic brooms do. Uh, let's see it in action, right, for example. So let's say we want to create a magic broom named Mickey. Let's go ahead, okay, and we want to, and we want to this broom to greet the people, like in this case. So what we do is, is just go ahead and create that. Now you notice that here in 9.3 we defined the constructor to accept two parameters. One, the name, and the other one which has a default value. This is how you create, you define parameters, you define functions with a default value. You always put them in the end, like here. Uh, so then this time Mickey has, uh, goes with the default, but then we create another magic broom, we named it Peter, and uh, uh, with another speed. Okay, so Let's see, what's Mickey's, that's the way you access property, right? Dot and just uh, the property. And that's how you use methods. So for example, yes, if you tell Mickey to go and fetch water, okay, the method is very stupid, it just prints some message, checks the speed and prints some message. Guess what would Peter do? Yes, it will go, but it will print also this, uh, the, the second message because of course this, its property of speed is, uh, does not match uh, that of the of uh, the if statement that you printed here. So this was very very stupid way to just define uh, the very um, let's say um, the, the, with a bit with some bit of a fantasy. We just uh, we we defined what objects are. Uh, so right now I will just go ahead and tell you something about regular expressions that we will be using, uh, as Matteo said in futures and uh, when we go back to the problem of named entity recognitions. Now I know that mm, most of you who follow the digital classics, uh, the Tsunagis digital classics have already had some sort of crash course in regular expressions. Uh, let me just recap a little bit and summarize and maybe do some definitions for those of you who uh, would, would, would didn't, uh, didn't follow this, uh, that particular uh, lessons on regular expression that, you, that, that, that was scheduled uh, in the Sunagesis DC. Uh, well, regular expressions, I can give you some definitions of regular expression, but the easiest way to understand what regular expressions is, is try to understand the kind of problems that they are very handy to solve, right? Many of you probably have found themselves in the situation where they uh, write the text, maybe a long text, book, or a chapter, or a thesis, dissertation, and then you have to modify a lot of things. Like, for example, you have to uh, like say that your supervisor doesn't like the way you format the bibliography, and then you should put a comma and not a colon after, your, after the years in the, in the bibliographic references. Uh, well, in order to do that, you will need to, to search and find all the references. You will need a way to just find all the numbers. Uh, in your text, but how do you do that with your typical uh, search and, and uh, replace uh, tools in your word processor? Uh, well, you can't unless you can tell your search and word processor 
not to think in terms of string, like string 0, string 1, 2, 3, but in terms of a class of a string, of a meta, meta type of, uh, of these strings, like all the numbers or all the capitalized letters, the words which start with a capital uh, letter, or all the strings in text that are all caps, something like that. Uh, as a very easy example, we can see this bit of, a, uh, of text and try to, to ask ourselves how we could find, how could we extract all the numbers in this, uh, in this paragraph. Uh, well, this is exactly what the regular expressions do. It's, uh, um, they allow you to express query, uh, a string of meta characters or group of meta characters, and then also to specify some instructions on what to catch. Uh, like, for example, meta characters, uh, class of meta characters like numbers that only are, that are followed by optionally more than one uh, of the same meta characters. So, uh, again, more than one number, or just one, or two, or three, or that are not preceded by some sort of sign. Uh, Python allows you to do, to do some operations in uh, using regular expressions. And a nice feature of the regular expression is Python, in Python is that if you use uh, the module uh, RE, regular expression, that's in the standard library, so you can already import them, and if you install Python, you already have it. Um, to, comp to create your patterns, you create them as complicated as you want, as objects, and then use methods for them, like, for example, to find strings and something like that. So you can think, again, your uh, patterns in uh, regular expression patterns in Python, like your magic brooms that allow you to do, to fetch the waters, uh, uh, the water around. Uh, here's how you do that, for example, to catch all the numbers. One way to do that is, is like this. You compile a pattern. Uh, and this will be the pattern, right? In, uh, in square bracket, you, you enter like uh, a range of characters, like 0 to 9 means all the numbers between 0 to 9. Plus here is an instruction that means uh, at least one of these or more. So if you find, if you have a long list of numbers, that will catch all of them. Uh, so we can compile this uh, regular expression and you see that the type of this object is a regular expression pattern. Uh, so this pattern again, as I said, has many, has a few. Uh, we can see them live. A few methods, right? Like this one. Uh, one of them, for example, that we can find is find all, that will catch the numbers uh, uh, as we defined. As you notice, was probably not the results that we wanted to have because, uh, for example, the negative numbers here were just captured, of course, because we didn't tell uh, the regular expression pattern to do that, but did just to catch the number. Uh, j with just the number one, two, three, and not minus one, minus two, minus three. And also in Wikipedia, this is the way you generate uh, in, um, footnote references, which might we might not want over here. So, if we want to refine our uh, our pattern so that we exclude this kind of uh, of situation, we can do that. So, for example, the minus is captured with this kind of syntax. Uh, this tells to have this character min minus and uh, which might which is optional this uh, question mark means it's optional if it's there catch it if it's not there don't catch it um, and this part is a little bit more complicated if you want uh, uh, but it just says uh, capture those numbers and the minus sign eventually even if it's there the minus sign if it is not preceded by this sign the parenthesis there we go that's better uh, now that we know something about uh, the syntax of regular expression, oh, uh, things that I forgot to say. Uh, what's this R? Yes, this pattern is a string. So we compile the, um, the regular expression pattern, uh, or the regular expression object with the, uh, with the regular string. But as you can see here, regular expressions uh, patterns often many times use this uh, backslash character to escape some special character, because as we see, we saw here we mean the square bracket, but square bracket in regular expression context mean uh, the beginning, for example, of a range. Uh, so that if we, re we want to extract the, the pattern to say, no, we just mean the character, back, uh, uh, square bracket, we usually escape that. Problem is that backspace is used in Python syntax to escape uh, again. So with this R preceded here, we just say, okay, 
interpret this string as a raw string. Don't, mm, don't worry about the Python internal uh, escaping process. So this way we avoid to, to write uh, many complicated, uh, this also sort of a double escaping. So uh, the short story is whenever you compile a pattern, whenever, uh, whenever you use a pattern, a regular expression in Python, always prevent this R over here that says it's a, a raw string. Uh, and probably you don't even have to know the, uh, the specific of why it's so. Um, it's, we can go back to, unless you, Matteo, you want to, to do something right now, we can just go to the uh, extraction of dates and uh, persons from text. All right, so let's do this. Now, you may remember that last time we had, uh, okay, I did the, this introduction to Python part that we recapped a little bit today. And Matteo uh, really uh, got more into the, 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 the main topic of named entity recognition. And he made also a very short and very an introduction, was very short and very to the point on uh, the concept of named entities. And one thing that you must, you must remember in uh, of his lecture is the fact that named entity as a notion is very domain and also task specific. So there are, there is a, um, uh, your, your definition of name and entity, which you, you will be interested in, uh, might change considering the domain that you work with and what you are uh, uh, interested to achieve. Uh, so we might be interested, for example, to search for other real life entities that are not typically used by people who work in computational linguistics, like for example, uh, time references, which sometimes is uh, captured by named entity recognition systems, sometimes, most of the time not. Uh, other um, specific, uh, um, like for example, institutions from the Roman history or museum objects might be extremely specific for, the, uh, for classical studies, for example. Uh, and today, we are going to expand on this concept and uh, we're not concentrate just on proper names uh, for uh, yes, for persons and for places, as we saw last time in the De Bello Gallico. But this time we will look also for other classes of entities, in the, uh, which are especially important if you work with modern scientific texts, like for example, uh, dates, dates and person. Persons will be left to you as an exercise. Uh, right now, let's see a little bit how to work with dates, like to how to extract the dates. Uh, so, as I said, we will work with uh, a modern article. We have uh, uh, a TXT version, a simple text version of a modern article that's taken from the scholarly journal here on, on ancient history. This article was published in 2012 and it's about Roman history. And we'll work with, uh, no, a little more than, uh, there's a mistake over here, it's 10, I mean 10,000. So it's about uh, 100 and, uh, 1,700, uh, so 1,700 uh, words. So uh, the first uh, 10,000 characters. So uh, again, as I showed last time, we read, uh, we read the contents of this text, text. And here we can see the first 1,000 characters, right? So this is a little bit to give you an idea of what we will, uh, we will be working with. Uh, now, Matteo also last time presented you something about, um, introduced you to the concept of uh, tagging the text, right? Uh, and let's see, again, uh, let's go back to this tagging part and let's also concentrate a little bit on one uh, specific type of tagging, which is most of the time the prerequisite to do all kind of jobs in computational linguistics, which is the part of speech tagging. Uh, by tagging, uh, we mean uh, that we will be coupling each word, right, each word in a text, uh, with a specific tag taken from a well-defined tag set, a limited tag set, uh, that describes some of the properties of the word itself. Part of speech tags then define what word class, for example, verb, proper noun, a text token belongs to. Uh, and um, as I write here, there are many tag sets that are used for uh, in specific language. So it's, it's a task that most of the time is language, spe language specific. So it's one thing to tag a text in English. It's a completely different thing to tag post tag 
a text in ancient Greek or Latin, for example. There are several software uh, that can be used and can be uh, used with classifiers, with pre-trained classifiers and models for a specific language uh, that you can use also to tag and post-tag, for example, your text automatically. Uh, one of the most used uh, one is Tritagger. You'll find a link to the software, uh, which also has, uh, which is very handy because it has uh, models, pre-trained models for many languages. Uh, and it also has a, mm, a wrapper to Python. Wrapper is just a uh, a library, a code that uh, can be used to invoke uh, the software from outside uh, uh, Python and handle the results and the output of this uh, process by the software within Python itself. So first thing we do is uh, import uh, this, this wrapper. And, and again, uh, look at this code over here. What do we do? Yes, the first thing that we do is we create another magic broom, right? Another object. So we create a dagger object, which doesn't do anything when you create it, but it's there to have a lot of methods to tag a text. So the, so the second thing that we will do is just use a tag method of this magic broom dagger that we created to tag a text. So let's do it. It's very quick also. And here we go. So it outputs our text again, but this time, as a list of lists, as you say, as you see, uh, where the word, which is just the, the first item in this list, is also um, followed by other objects, uh, by, by other information. Uh, the middle one, index one, so the second element in the, in the list, is a tag. The third one is a lemma. Um, here we go. So we can work with that. So why do we need this? Um, well, we need that for a, for, uh, for a series of operations that we will be doing in order to extract uh, the named entities. Uh, we'll see that in a second. Another thing that we can say is that this information is, uh, is used using a tag set that is very, used for, very often used, that of the um, uh, pen tree bank, to, uh, for English. Like, for example, it tells you that the, the article the is a determiner, of is a preposition which is used as tagged in, uh, JJ is an adjective, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. Noun, plural, are, are N and S, etc. Um, so another way of tagging would be to use uh, the Stanford uh, NER, like that Matteo used last time, to um, append not just this kind of part of speech tags, but uh, named entity classification tags. So to say if something is a location, a person, or uh, an organization. Uh, so let's do that as well. Let's use this pre-trained classifier for English that use three classes, so just person, uh, places, and locations, and uh, uh, tags uh, the English words. Um, so it takes a little longer this time, but it's done. So let's see the result. Well, it's not very good because it, it was, it of course, was trained with texts that are from a completely different domain, and so it's not trained to recognize the, some of the locations of persons that are more often cited in. Uh, it would do much better so if you use, for example, a newspaper article. Uh, so you see, for example, that Roman was tagged as a location, Republic as a location, which doesn't make so much sense uh, in, this const in, this concept, uh, in this context, and so on. So before we move on and we see how to extract a named entity, right? So you say, OK, we got this tag, so we can just say that, oh, Roman is a location, Republic is a location, well, or pretend it is. Well, not quite. Uh, we, are, uh, we need a little bit of, uh, of working and uh, of, uh, um, uh, yes, to, to, to work a little bit with this output a little bit before we move on. Uh, what we need to do right now is chunking. What do we mean by chunking? Uh, as you can see immediately, uh, we analyze a text proceeding word by word, right? We do this operation that is called tokenization. So we separate the words from the punctuations and so on in this text. And then we analyze word by word, saying, ah, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is an adjective, and so on. Uh, however, if you have, for example, named entities like New York City or President Barack Obama, uh, that we might discuss if president is a part of a named entity or not, but anyway, uh, say you are interested in ke keeping also this title, uh, you are actually spanning more than one word, right? So um, what you need is something that 
classify each word correctly, but then says, okay, this word belongs together and makes a named entity, like New York City. We are talking about New York and not talking about the English town of York. Um, so, taking, um, subdividing a text, section of it, or a portion of a text, into chunks, phrases that go together, is what uh, is referred to as chunking. Here you see in this image how chunking works, right? So, <laughs> for example, in this phrase, we saw, though in sentence, we saw the yellow dog, uh, the noun phrases, as you would define them in linguistics, would be either, consist either of one single token, like, for example, we, or a more complex chunk, more complex phrases, like the yellow dog. So, determiner, adjective, noun. Uh, so, to say that these three tags, these, these three tokens that have been tagged as determiners, adjective, noun, all belong together in a noun phrase is what we do with tagging. Matteo, maybe with chunking, sorry. Matteo, last time, introduced you to the notation that is typically used in this case, again, in a word-by-word -word context or token-by-token -token context, the IOB notation, where you can just keep the information split into... Uh, were into different tokens, but then says whether a token belongs to a chunk or not. Uh, so, uh, apart from the, 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 the tag of the chunk, so noun phrase, you will also append this uh, prefix bi to say if something is at the beginning or an internal part of a chunk, or if something doesn't belong to the chunk together. So, for example, in the so the yellow dog, so it's tagged O because it's not in the it's not, it's not in the chunk, it's not in the noun phrase. Uh, the is the beginning of the noun phrase, so it gets tag B uh, now NP. I N P for yellow, and the final part of the chunk is again I N P. And it will be followed again by something that is not part of this chunk. Um, so for example, if we have uh, so again, follow me. What we had from here is just a chunking that says, it's just a tagging of a text that says, okay, purely in a token by token uh, perspective. Roman is a location. Then forget about the locations. Again, Republic, oh, I recognize that as a location as well. So if we have something like in New York City, it will just tag in, not part, uh, in um, nothing, new location, York location, city location, and we can immediately see that these three tokens belong together and they make a location. So, um, so that they should be chunked together as a beginning of lock, uh, internal, internal. Uh, this is how we do when we chunk. Uh, and in Python, it's relatively easy to create your chunker that will pass from this output, so token by token, to an IOB uh, notation that will say, okay, this is also part of, uh, of a chunk. Uh, and again, look what you will use. We will use some sort of a regular expression uh, syntax. Um, so here's what, what, what you will do. You will define some rules that, uh, for example, says that a location followed by a location, one or more location, like New York, could be just York, if it's a British town of York, or it could be New York City, three locations. And that's exactly what the asterisk does. It says that this element over here in uh, regular expression uh, syntax might be there as many times. It's sort of it's like the plus that we plus sign that we saw before, but it also says that it might even not occur uh, even once. So we can just it wouldn't this will match if we only had one location followed by something that is not location, and or if it is followed by multiple locations. So. In the NLTK library, there are uh, chunkers that work with this kind of syntax, with this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, grammars. They will look at the tokens in your um, in your uh, uh, token in your tokenized and your tagged uh, um, input. We just look at the at the, at the sequence of the uh, of the of the tags, and we'll chunk together things that work that have the same. Uh, the same uh, the, 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 the tags that that, that uh, respect your own grammar rules. Okay, over here we just defined also more a little. Bit, we made use a little bit more uh, of the regular expression syntax because we didn't just want to say location followed by a location, but we may allow some uh, error in the classification. So, if for example, 
uh, a location is followed by a token that, is, that was not just a, a location, but it's tagged as a person, organization, chances might be that uh, this, they all belong together and they, make, they might make uh, uh, a location as well. So let's see how we, how we perform here. Uh, let's run this parser. Okay, so again, we defined our magic broom, the chunker, and then we use the method parse for, with the chunker with a list of our input. For uh, brevity's sake, we just use the first 20 words. And we see that what we had is exactly what we were expecting. So, Praetorium, Proconsul, okay, tag does nothing, off, tag does nothing, O, oh, and here we got a chunk, a Roman Republic location. Okay, so let's uh, not consider the fact that here we don't, that it's not a real location. But anyway, uh, the chunker did exactly what it was supposed to do, right? It took two from the subsequent words that had a tag location and jumped them uh, and glued them together. Uh, are we passed to an IUB notation? Fortunately, there is a ready-made function to do that. So you can just, uh, uh, it's in the um, NLTK chunk library and it's called uh, tree to con tags. Right, you pass a tree, so it's an object that we created from here. It's the output of the, uh, of the previous part. And we can just have the notation. Here, here we go, it's exactly what we were expected. Beginning of, of the lock chunk, internal part of lock chunk, and so on. Back again to our original task on the, uh, how to extract dates. To find dates, extract the dates, and tag them, and export them to an IOB. Um, okay, so how would we find dates in, uh, in a text? Well, most of the time dates are just numbers, like for example 2017, or sometimes they are in a more complex format, like 14 September 2017, or 14-09-2017. Uh, uh, and the simple solution, as I write here in this part of uh, the notebook, uh, might be to just to design a, a tag. So, to, do a to use a chunker, as we said before, but so to work with a, some sort of a specifically designed tagger that will just tag if something goes, if, if something respects um, the format of a date or not. Um, and so, in order to do that, we would need for, to use again regular expression syntax, because again, we were dealing with numbers, for example. Uh, and followed by or not followed by some sort of dash or some other some month names or something like that. Uh, and a tagger that would work with regular expression pattern. So we'll analyze a tag and, uh, sorry, uh, a token in our text and we'll say, yes, this looks like something that uh, uh, respects your regular expression pattern. And again, in the NLTK uh, module, the NLTK library, a natural language toolkit library that we imported in the beginning, there is a tagger that does exactly that. So the tagger works with uh, accept, accepts, is initialized again. So the R magic broom is initialized with a list of patterns that are written as uh, regular expression patterns. This one, for example, is very simple. It says, take me all the numbers until the, uh, that ends, uh, that goes until the end of the, of the token. This is what the dollar sign means. Uh, and then tag it as CD, which is the Pentry Bank uh, tag for numbers. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated. It says number, uh, one or more, uh, followed by a dash, which is maybe a long dash or a small dash, it's followed by another, uh, another uh, number. And append the, classify this, tag this as date. This is again more complicated and it allows for formats of date. This is just by using this pipe sign, allows to say January, February, March, April, May, either January or February or March, March or April or May, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will match and uh, give, the date, give it the date tag. Uh, this is for years, for example, if you get four, exactly four uh, numbers uh, in the token, or give zero to the rest, O to the rest. So we initialize the pattern, we initialize our magic broom, and then we tag this stupid sentence, I was born on September 14 or 14-9. Yeah, that's exactly what we were supposed to do, right? Find September and it gives the date tag, find 14 and it gives it the CD, the number tag, and date. So let's, now, let's see it now in action with our own text and let's see the, uh, the output. Yes, we see that here we've got 2011-52, which is, by the way, our time range, so it's exactly what it's supposed to do, and it gives a date 
Okay, we will see here a first problem. We will be back uh, to that uh, later on. So now we just have to initialize a chunker to say, okay, so select some sort of uh, uh, the sequence of chunks that we, the sequence of tags that make up a date. Uh, here's how we will do it. And let's do it. We create a tree here. And uh, uh, let's generate uh, this, this, the, the IOB list. Let's see the first, uh, uh, for example, the first like uh, 20 items in this, uh, in this IOB list. Uh, okay, yes, that was recognized uh, correctly. Uh, if you say something more. Well, we see we got a lot of problems right here, right? Um, also because it was very stupid what we did. We just found, we just say every number is a date, which is a kind of a stupid assumption. But uh, most of the time, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. One problem that we might be wanting to fix is the fact that BCE is clearly a chronological uh, uh, indications that we might want to add. So here, uh, where do we define this? Well, it's here, it's in the pattern, right? We would say that, for example, uh, uh, BCE, either BCE or we, sometimes it's called, it's just written BC, sometimes, or even the AD, yes, if something is more dilated, this also make uh, for, uh, uh, oh yes, forgot to say that this should be tagged as date. All right, so let's rerun the tagger again. Let's see if we, if we get that. Yes, now it's tagged as date, good. And uh, let's rechunk this. And let's see if this date was now correct. Yes, okay, so 211.52 BC is now recognized as a chunk, as a date. Um, now we can just write this down in a file uh, and, uh, and use it for the, for the, uh, for the following uh, part. Uh, that pretty much exhausts what I have to say. Okay, so it's, uh, it's back to me. Um, before we actually see how to evaluate uh, what Francesco has just, did, has just, did, just done with extracting the dates, um, let's uh, go back to the extraction of named entities from the, the Bello Gallico and see how to analyze a bit the data. Before I actually uh, do that, let me uh, say something about the, your notebooks, because I've done a bit of housekeeping today on the um, Jupyter server, and I've moved around a bit your notebook. So if you go back and you don't find um, the notebooks on which you have worked, here's the reason why. I've essentially moved all your notebooks, so the notebooks of the participants, to a subfolder. Um, so I saved them, stopped them, and then I moved them to, to this folder. So if you need, for any reason, to go back to it, that's where you will find it. Um, so that was the short announcement. Uh, Okay, so let's take it from where we left it. Um, the last thing we did in the, um, in the previous session was to have three different algorithms to extract named entities from the book one of the Debello Gallico. So we had a relatively simple baseline, then we used the library CLTK, and then we used NLTK. Um, and here is the first problem. How do you actually move Python objects from one notebook environment to another. Well, essentially what you need to do is to save them to, to the memory, save them to the hard drive of the machine, and then read them from another notebook. So you can either do it, um, save them as a text format using a specific syntax, and then parse that text file using, uh, by following that syntax and get back the data or you actually can save the raw Python object as a binary file in the memory. And this is done in Python by the Pico library. Um, so here is an example of how you actually use the, this Pico library to save the, your uh, objects, Python objects to the, to the uh, hard drive. Um, and this is what I did from the older notebook, so the, the, my notebook from the first session. Uh, I took the list, and the list were the list that we obtained by running each method on the, um, on the, on the, on the text uh, of the, uh, the Bello Gallico. Um, 
And I took those lists and I saved them to a file. And here you can see the path of where that file is in the, uh, is, is in, on the hard drive. So if we go to the data directory, for example, um, you can see them here. So these are files that I've created and where, in which I've saved the list that we created in the first session. Um, so what, as you save them, you can also read them back in memory. Um, so to do this, we first import um, the, the PICO library. Um, then for each file, we open the file, as you can see here. Um, you open the file and you create a pointer to the file in the variable f. Um, and then you pass this variable to the PICO uh, PICO's, uh, method load. And what this does is to read from the file your list and put it back in another variable. So in this case, in the tag text base, baseline. And we do it for each file. And for each file, we initialize a different variable. So what we uh, let's have a look. Uh, for example, if we take the baseline, the first 10, uh, 10 tokens, then we have what we created the last time. In the first um, element of the tuple, you have the token. And then in the second element, you have um, the name entity tag. So now that we got back our data, as we created them the last time, uh, here you can see the same thing uh, that we did. So comparing baseline, CLTK output, and NLTK's output for the first 20 tokens, just to, to show you that um, all the information is there. Um, now we can do some basic statistics uh, about these asserted name entities. So let's try to do two things. First, um, let's try to, to know how um, entities, to know which entity types were extracted. So um, how many uh, person location, uh, how many uh, persons, persons names, how many locations, um, how many organizations. Uh, and then we will look at the old name entities and we'll try to plot and find out what are the most frequent. So the first thing to do um, to be able to count them by type um, is to, take, to, to focus on one of the outputs. And we focus on the output generated by NLTK because it has, uh, more, has uh, many different types, whereas for the other two outputs, we only have the very general entity, um, entity tag. And here you can see uh, what the, uh, our, our list um, looks like. Um, what we want to do is to create a list of all the named entity types identified by NLTK. So to be able to do this, first we create um, an empty list called NLTK tags. And in this list, we are going to put all the types we find in the output. Um, so we iterate through uh, the, the list, the tag text NLTK list. Um, each tuple in the list contain the tokens and the tag, and we save this into separate variable. Um, and then what we do is simply to append to the new list that we created in line one, the name entity tag that was identified. Um, so we do this. Um, what you obtain here, we um, print the output for the first 10 lines. It's a list with duplicates, of course, of all the entity types that were extracted. Uh, there is also a more elegant, a more Pythonic way of doing this. Uh, which is by using a programming construct that it's called list comprehension. And it's essentially an expression that goes through a list and outputs another list. Uh, and this allows you, instead of having three lines to do what we want, to have one single line where we use the list comprehension, we express exactly the same thing. So we iterate through the list, we take token and tag, and then we output only the tag. And we create a new list only with the text. And it does the very same thing. It's just in a more compact way. Um, and once you start going more in, in depth into Python, you will actually realize how useful that is. Uh, OK, now that we have a list with all the entity types with duplicates, uh, what we need uh, to do is to have a way of grouping those duplicates. So we want to say, for example, for uh, the location tag, LOC, how many times does it occur in the list? 
Um, and to do this, what, um, a data structure that is very useful, uh, it's a dictionary. Why? Because in a dictionary, uh, each key of the dictionary is unique. This means that the LOC type will occur only once in, in our dictionary. And then every time it occurs, uh, we can keep a counter. And the counter will be one the first time LOC occurs. Uh, and then every time we find it, we update an increase of one discounter. Um, let's see how we do it with the code. So first of all, we initialize an empty dictionary. Uh, then we iterate through the list of NLDK tags, which is this one. The one that we just uh, that we just created. Here we go. Um, then we we have an if statement here uh, at line nine until fourteen. Um, if the tag we find it's already in the dictionary, then we just increase the counter. Uh, and to access a specific item in a dictionary we use this notation with the, uh, with the square brackets. So we, we reference the dictionary counts, and then we give it the, um, the tag that was found in the list. If it's already in the dictionary, then we update it, of, we increase it of one. That's what the plus equal operators uh, does. If it's not in the list, we, it's, if it's not in the dictionary, sorry, we add it, and we give value of one because it was the first time um, that it was encountered. So uh, once we run this, let's now have a look at the um, at our dictionary. So the keys of the dictionary are my entity types. So you have O for other, per for person, or for organization, and log for locations. Um, if we want to see the counter for LOC, then we just reference by key, and the key is LOC, and then we can, we can print it. So LOC was found 22 times, and we can do the same for the per persons. We can also just print the content of the whole dictionary. And here you have all the counters um, with the counts divided by, by type. Um, this is how you actually implement it, but since it's, um, it's a thing that you may want to do many times, uh, this is actually already implemented uh, in the collections um, library of Python. So there is an object, and by now you know, thanks to Francesco's uh, magic room, what, what an object is. So you have the counter object, and what this counter does, it takes um, a dictionary as input, uh, sorry, a list, uh, as input, in this case, our NLTK tags with all the tags with all the duplicates, and it returns another sort of dictionary with the counts. So the same things that we obtained by writing our um, 14 lines of code, this is done by calling one method of one object. Um, so let's, uh, let's try to do it. We import the object we need, then we call it here, um, and then here we look at the, at the output. Okay, so we did it for the type. Um, let's see it for the, for the entity frequency. Uh, so we do a similar thing, but we don't focus any longer on the entity type, but on the entity itself. So how many times, for example, Caesar was found. Um, so what we do is, again, to iterate through all the entities extracted by NLTK, initialize a new list where we store our new entities. Um, we iterate through the list, we save the token and the tag. Uh, then we check if the tag is different from other, because we don't, we're not interested in um, tokens that are not entities. We're just interested in tokens that are entities. So we filter them out. If the tag is other, um, then we don't do anything. Uh, if it's different from other, then we append our token to the list of entities. Um, so if we run this, and then we look at the, uh, at the output, let's say the first 20, um, 20 entities, these are the entities that were extracted from, by, by NLTK. Um, and now we, we have seen already how to create a list with uh, a dictionary with frequency of, the, um, of all the entities. We use the counter object. 
So we do the same. We call the counter object passing this list of entities. And what we get back is um, a counter. Uh, let's here have a look at the, um, at the content. You will see each content with the number of times it occurs. So uh, Kesarem, four times, uh, Kaiser, 21, and so on. So you have a list of frequency of how many times the entities occur in the text according to an LTK. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that what is returned by counter is not actually a dictionary. It's a special kind of dictionary. It's called counter. And this special kind of dictionary has some methods that actually do some interesting things. And one of the methods is, for example, to print um, a list, an ordered list um, ordered by, by frequency of the things that are found in the counter. So in this case, if you call the method most common on our counter object, you actually get um, a sorted list of tuples where the first item of the tuple is the entity and the second um, is how many times it appears. Uh, well, there, we can actually, there, there are actually um, other ways of sorting uh, this uh, without using this method, but just we are running a bit um, short with time, so we skip it. Let's see now how you can, can count, sort, and do some plotting on, on this uh, information that we already started to, to explore. So you need two libraries, Pandas and Seaborn. So Pandas is a data analysis library, um, while Seaborn is actually used to visualize statistical data. And these two libraries play very well together, and they're often used in combination. So you can take objects from one library and pass them to objects in, an, in the other library. So first of all, we import them. Um, and then we give to the Jupyter Notebook an instruction saying that all the plots we are going to generate will be showed in line, so will be showed directly in the, in the notebook. Otherwise, they are saved on the file, and you need to call them from the file. So that's why we need this. Um, so Pandas is actually a very, very powerful library. Uh, but at the end, what it provides is a data structure called data frame. And you can think of a data frame as a, as a spreadsheet, essentially. Uh, so we can actually create a new data frame from our dictionary counts that we generated before. Um, so here, just to remind you, here you have your dic dictionary with the entities and the counts, the number of times they appear. You can call pandas, the data frame object, and a specific method, it's a, it's a helper, um, that says create this data frame from the dictionary. And then you convert the counter object into a dictionary, and you pass it to the, to the a pandas data frame. Um, if we do it, what you, you have at the end looks, and it's also printed in a very similar way to a table. Uh, the column name, it's zero, which is not very useful. So let's rename it. And to rename it, you just reassign all the names to the columns. So here we say uh, there is just one column. So that's why the list has only one item. Uh, and we reassign and we change the name. Uh, with the method info, you can put you can output some information about the types of the data you have in the in your data frame, in your sort of spreadsheet. Um, you can look, for example, uh, using the method uh, head at the first lines. Um, so in this case, you can look at the first uh, five lines by default. But if you pass 10, then you look at the first 10 lines of your table. Uh, and you can do the same for the tail. So for the last five entities, five, five rows of the table, or for the last 10, for example. Okay, so now that we have it, we want to actually sort it. Uh, and sort it, you, we do it by calling the sort values method of our data frame. And with a by parameter, we say sort by what? In, in this case, we want to sort by count. And then we want to uh, order by descending order. So from the most frequent to the least frequent. And, we do, and we, that, that's why we pass the ascending parameter to this, to this method. So if we do this, we actually get a sorted count of all our rows in the table. That's great. Um, let's print again our data frame. Oops, 
Now, if we print it, it's back to the unsorted version. This is why the, this is because the sort values method, it's not changing the content of the data frame, but it works on a copy. So if we actually want to change the content of the data frame, we need to reassign the variable with the new copy that we generate, which is a sorted copy. So let's do that. Uh, and now it's actually, it's a sorted data frame. Um, so now we move to the second bit, which is using Seaborn, uh, this visualization library, um, to just do a very basic um, uh, histogram plot of the frequency uh, of our entities. Uh, and if you go to the to the Seaborn website, you can actually see um, this is uh, you can see it also here all the various kinds of visualizations uh, they have. We're just using a very simple um, histogram. Um, and the nice thing is that the Seaborn library takes a pandas data frame as an input. So you have the bar plot method that creates a, a bar plot, <laughs> as it says. You can pass to it as data the data frame. Uh, in this case, we pass just the first, the top 10, the top 10 entities. So these, these entities here. Uh, and then you specify the x axis and the y axis of your of your um, of your plot. Um, so on the x axis, we want to have the count, uh, the frequency of the entities, and on the y, we want to have the label of each author. Uh, and once you call it, it generates already with some uh, nice visual features a plot of the entities that were found. Uh, so in this case, you see uh, Caesar Gallia some uh, false positives, some things that are not actually uh, entities, and they are ordered by, um, by count. Um, so again, yeah, this is an explanation of uh, how to call the function. You can call the function using this slice uh, of, the, of your table. You can, instead of passing the top 10, you can uh, output the top 20. And here is the, the plot that you, that you, that you get. Uh, we can also do some plotting on the Net entity types. Um, we do it uh, very quickly. So this is the same code um, that we've seen above. Um, we count all the types, then we pass the resulting dictionary um, and cre we create a data frame. In this case, the data frame is much shorter. We rename the column as we did already. And when you look at it, you see location, organization, person with a count. And of course, other, which is um, the most frequent entity. Uh, and then we can do a pie chart using directly um, pandas, not even going to Seaborn, but pandas has already some plotting functionalities. Um, and we just say the values come from the count column of our data frame, and the type of plot is going to be uh, a pie chart, uh, which is not that great, because in this case, you see the other type, which is just too prominent, there are just too many. So we, we, can, um, we can essentially redo our count, but in this case, we add at line seven an if statement and we skip the entity if it's, a, if it's other. So we redo the count, then we have just three types, and then you can do uh, the plotting, a much nicer uh, plotting of the named entities by type. Um, now let's go to the last part of the, um, of the talk, uh, which is on the evaluation of, uh, of an NLP task, in this case, the extraction of named entities. Why do we want to evaluate it? Well, the, the very simple reason is that by establishing a standardized way of um, evaluating, we can compare different algorithms to, that perform the same task. Um, there is some jargon involved in the evaluation, uh, baseline came uh, came up already the last time, and baseline is your term of comparison. For example, what Francesco did with dates using the regular expressions can be the baseline for to compare it with more sophisticated um, algorithms. Then you have the ground truth, uh, which is a set of manually corrected data that you need to perform your evaluation because you want to compare something that was extracted automatically against the ground truth, against what actually should have been uh, should have been extracted. Uh, and then other terms that came up are 
gold set, dev set, and test set. So the gold set is your ground truth, is a set of data manually corrected, um, manually corrected by some annotators. Um, then you have a test set, which is another data set that you should use only for the evaluation, which is different, of course. And then all the development you do to develop your algorithm should be done on a separate set, which is called dev set. So these three um, terms, if you read the uh, NER papers, they often often come up. And then you, what you normally do in one of these papers is to have a table, like the one shown in this slide, uh, where you compare measures, so three different measures, for different algorithms. Um, and these measures are precision, recall, and F-score. Um, and, I'm, and I'm now going uh, to go in details through, um, through each of them. Um, so first of all, uh, to, to compute these three measures, you need to classify your errors into types. So you have positive labels, in this case, B date and I date, according to the syntax that uh, Francesco has, the IUB syntax that Francesco has already explained. And then you have negative labels. They are negative because they don't represent an, an entity. They are just these all other um, labels. And uh, based on this uh, first categorization, you have four types of entities. They are called true, true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. And here I also give some examples. So the easiest case, uh, it's a true positive, which is a correct match. It's essentially when the label in your gold set, in your ground truth, is the same as the label that was automatically extracted from, from your software, from your, your algorithm. This is a true positive. It's a correct match. Then you have a false positive. Uh, the false positive is when the label, it's not an entity uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the ground truth, but your software does an error and outputs the label of an entity, in this case, B date. And this error is called false positive. It's there, but shouldn't have been there. Um, so it's a, it's a wrongly extracted um, entity. Then you have true negatives. Uh, there are labels that are not entities, both in the ground truth and in the output of your software. So it's a, it's a correctly identified negative label, so to say. And then you have false negatives. Um, and the false negatives are in the ground truth, they are tagged as entities, but your software, your algorithm misses them. So they, they as opposed to the true positives, they are actually missed, um, missed entities. Um, so you have these four, um, four types of, um, of entities, of, of errors. Based on this uh, type of errors, you, you compute um, two different things, uh, precision and recall. Um, so here in this, in this diagram, you see, um, you should focus on two things. So the, the circle um, with, the, with the black border are all the entities extracted by your algorithm. And this in includes some true positives, correct entities, and also some false positives, entities that shouldn't be there. And the ratio of the true positives over all, over all this, um, all, uh, the sum of true positives and false positives is called precision. And, and it measures how many selected items are relevant. So selected items are those in the circle, and it measures how many of them are actually correct, the true positives. But you can also look at the recall. So you can also look at, at how many of the correct elements, of the relevant elements, are actually missed by your system. So this gives you a different perspective on, on the accuracy. Uh, and you do this uh, with the recall. In the recall, you, um, you focus on true positives in relation to the false negatives. So the entities that should have been captured but were missed by your system. Uh, and these are the very simple um, formulas that you use. So the precision, as we just said, is the fraction of the retrieved entities that are correct, as opposed to the recall, which is the fraction of correct entities that are retrieved. And then you put them together in a global score, which is called F-score, which is, technically speaking, a mean, a weighted harmonic mean of precision and recall. So you combine these two different perspectives on the data into a single score. 
Um, and now let's quickly um, go back to the to the notebook and see how you can compute them. Um, so first of all, we need to read the data that Francesco has tagged automatically. So what we do is to read it from the IOB file that, as you remember, was generated at the end of the um, of, of his notebook. We open it, we read the content, and what you, we get is a bunch of data with these uh, slash t and slash n. So slash t are the tabs character, and the slash n are the new lines. So from this text, we actually need to split it back into the original list of tuples. Uh, how we do it? We do it using the list compression that we've seen the, before. Um, so first of all, we split the data by line. If the line is empty, we ignore it. So if line is different from empty, we consider it. And then we split each line using the tab character. And if we run this, what gives to you is the same list of uh, tuples that Francesco has outputted. Uh, to be able to do the evaluation, he has corrected manually, he has um, uh, established the ground truth. So corrected manually a set of data that we can use to do the evaluation. And we also need to uh, read them as we did for the automatically generated ones. So we uh, open the file, we read them, and then we split them by line and by tab as we just did. And here you can actually compare the two lists side by side. And maybe we'll, uh, you remember this zip function that takes two lists and goes through them. Uh, putting them essentially side by side. And here you see in the first column, there is the output of the ground truth. So the tags that should be there. And in the second column, you have uh, the tags that were actually extracted. And here, for example, you see the, uh, the date. So after Francesco did that change, then the date is correct. But for example, uh, this number one, it's not in the ground truth tagged as a, a date whereas his software, his algorithm thought it was a date. So this is what we have. Uh, we're not interested in the actual tokens. We're just interested in the labels. So we, we iterate through the data, and we just keep um, the, the third item of the list, which is the label. Um, so if we do it, we get, then we get uh, a bit more than 1,700 um, labels. We do the same for the, for the ground truth, so the thing to compare with. Um, and we make sure that we have the same number of, of labels. Um, just to be clear, this is what the first 20 labels look like. So you have a list of all the la labels identified by the algorithm. Now we need to compute our error types. So we create a dictionary with counters, as we did in the first part of the, of the notebook. And we have the keys represent our error type. So you have true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. And initially, they are all set to zero. Uh, now we, we use, again, the, the zip function, um, iterating through the labels. So here you can see, for example, side by side, just the label of ground truth and automatically strengthened. Um, and here, in this longer bit, we populate our dictionary with the error types. So we iterate through our uh, two lists. And then the first thing we need to check if, if it's, it's, a, it's a positive or a negative uh, case. So if the label in, in the ground truth is O, that means that it's not an entity. If it's different from O, then it's an entity. So if it's another entity and we have the gold label that equals the automatically identified label, then it's a, true, it's a true negative. So it's a label that is not an entity and was correctly identified as such. But if we have um, in the gold label other and in our output something different from other, this means that we have a false positive. Um, a false positive is something that the, the algorithm identified as an entity, but it's not an entity. So we need to increase the counter of the false positive. And then we do the same for the case where 
in the ground truth we have an entity if we have an entity in the ground truth and the same label in the automatic output then it's a true positive um, otherwise it's a false negative so we iterate then we have our dictionary with with all the counts that we similar to the one we had before and now we we need to pass this dictionary to the functions that take care of computing uh, the, the measures that we have so we have the precision as we identified before this is the mathematical formula we encaps we we implement this formula in a function called calculate precision calc precision to which we pass our dictionary of errors uh, and what it does is takes the true positives and it divides them, divides the number of true positives over the sum of true positives and false positives. Um, and if you pass your dictionary of errors to this function, then you get an, a number, which is the precision of your system. And here it's slightly more uh, that 50%, 50 which is the, uh, a chance, chance rate, which is not great, but it was a baseline, so it's, it's fine. Uh, this 59% um, is the ratio of entities correctly identified by the system. Uh, but then we can also compute the recall, as we defined before. Here is the formula. Similarly, we implement, a, a, we, we write a function called calc recall, to which we pass the dictionary of errors, um, and it does all the calculation. And we call it, pass in our dictionary of errors, and then we get a 0 0.92, which actually means that the, this algorithm is not missing many correct entities. So it has, as we say, a high um, recall rate. And then we have the, the F score, which combines both um, according to this formula. So it's two multiplied by precision, multiplied by recall, over the sum of precision and recall. Here is a function that does the computation. And then the F score um, that you get is, um, 0.72 percent i think the, uh, the, the there is uh it's a bit different from what i had before i had uh 0.6 so i think ah uh, okay okay so what i had before was uh working with the um, the first version of the system that francesco had and what is computing now is actually the improvement of adding uh, another regular expression pattern to his uh, to his object um, and here it calculates output the uh, 0.72 f score and then you can print your summary of the um, uh, okay uh, summary of the errors and here there is actually um, we need to say uh, so very quickly uh, let's go precision let's go uh, we need to, to, to save this to memory, otherwise we have the wrong, the old numbers. So we say precision is this, um, recall variable captures the recall, and then we have F score for the F score. Uh, and here you can print your summary. 0 0.59 precision, 0 0.92 recall, and an F score of 0 0.7. Uh, this is done by implementing the um, each measure so actually writing how it should be computed but there are also libraries that do this automatically um, because it's something that typically you do many times and you want to have some standardized way of of doing this so for example the scikit learn library which is used very often for which is used for machine learning has an implementation of of this in one function which is called precision recall as core support uh, and to this function, you pass two lists, the list of correct labels and the list of automatically identified labels. You see them here. So the first two parameters are the two lists. Um, and then you say, what are the positive lab labels, B date and I date. Uh, and then you also speci specify what kind of average in this, kind, in this ca case, what we do is called micro average. And then you can um, do the same. Um, assign the output of this method to your variables, and then output the, um, uh, the, the scores that are, that are almost identical. 
um, but we, I think we went uh, a bit long, uh, but that's, um, yeah, that's it for this, uh, for this session. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Technical, the last part, I have to say, but clear, very clear. So thank you. And uh, we also have a lot of material online. So questions, please. We're a bit over, but uh, of course, <laughs> we would like to have questions. I have a question just out of curiosity more than anything else. Um, you, when you were talking about the false positives and negatives um, and the true positives and negatives um, in that list, I was wondering where, um, where in that pattern would fit um, where your gold standard had identified it as an entity, but your algorithm has, had identified it as a different entity. So it was, it, yeah. it would count as a true positive in your algorithm, but 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 it wasn't quite true. Um, but in fact, what we do is to uh, to compute it um, entity by entity, uh, so label by label. Okay, so you're only so looking, if, it's, yeah. if it should be a yeah. B date, but it's an I date, right. then it's a false positive. Then it's false. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So is it's it a false actually, positive or a false negative? Um, no, it's a false positive okay. because yeah, okay. uh, B date it's a it's a positive label, it's an entity. But what yeah. your output? It's a different label than the one correct, but it's still an entity. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So it's it's a bit technical, but it's a, uh, it's it's quite important because it gives you a standardized way of uh, assessing the accuracy of your system. And what what I should have said is also that. Um, the measure that you apply and how you compute them, it's also changing based on the task at hand. So in this case, it's the expression of the named entities. But if you are evaluating, I don't know, a machine translation, then you tweak uh, slightly your measures to reflect the task that you are evaluating. Um, shall we say maybe briefly something about the assignment? Um, it's, it's explained in the wiki, um, and it consists of um, extracting um, the person mentions from the journal article that Francesco uh, was considering. Let me take the, um, uh, so it's this one. It's at the very, at the very, uh, at the very end. Um, annotating the person names. You are not screen sharing anymore, I don't think. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Share. Now she'll be back. Yes. Yeah, so extracting the person names from the journal article using the Stanford Name Identity um, Recognition Classifier. Uh, so it's actually putting together uh, what we have seen in this session and in the previous session. Um, and we ask you also to use uh, the functions that you can take from my, from the second notebook, to do the evaluation of uh, the Stanford NER classifier. Um, so what you will take is the output of the Stanford classifier, compare it with the ground truth, which is in this file. Francesco has already done the work of correcting the data for you, so you don't need to do it. Um, you will need to read the data from this file using the functions that I showed. Um, and then using the functions to compute precision recall and F-score, you will produce a report of the evaluation metrics for the Stanford uh, NER. So if you, um, once you review this session, you go back to the notebooks and you will find all the different bits and pieces of code that you can put together um, to do your assignment. I may perhaps add one thing about that. Uh, and it's... Uh, um, yes, in this notebook, in the notebook that I used, so the 2A FM notebook, you will find uh, so in this instruction pretty much everything. So how to use the named entities, uh, the, the Stanford NER is defined in the, in the code above, and uh, the files that you should have uh, used as gold standard and uh, text are already there. Uh, one thing that probably is missing is the fact that the, the functions for evaluations are defined in Mateo. Uh, notebook and the other to be, we will add, we will add the I will copy and paste them. Yes. Yeah, because it's, it's the easiest. 
and then uh, and then that's it uh, pretty much everything else is there and of course you can call us if you, you can write us an email or write to the to the board of Sonoki if you get problems you see technical problems okay thank you very much Francesca and Matteo for this well, uh, thank you. It was really great. I, I'm going to add one last thing, very, very general, but we always mention that uh, in our Sunoikis you know, session. So, name entities, we have seen examples with uh, English, uh, some Latin, of course, we need to collect data. For example, for ancient Greek. So, we would like to have name entities recognition also for language like Greek. And then we have other languages, of course. But we need data, uh, we need uh, a lot of work. And then there are also other problems still for Greek, for example, character encodings and so on. We can't mention that. But anyway, um, it's good to see the work that uh, we have. We have a lot, but we still have to, to do many things. So uh, this is a general uh, note. Yeah, and very, very good that you mentioned this because in the in the further reading for this session, we have a link to a paper that is actually discussing the challenges of doing this. So, an illustration for Latin. Excellent. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah, that's great. Okay, this is important uh, in general, and yes, okay, good. Uh, oh, and maybe perhaps one last thing that we may ask. Uh, I showed some uh, ways of using regular expression. Uh, just please remember that these are not the only way, and probably not even the most used ways of uh, performing name um, entity recognition uh, or to train models. Or, uh, this is just a, just to show you how you can do things quickly with regular expression and so on. There are actually much more complicated uh, uh, tools that people use to do that in real life, but it's a start. It's a, it's a way to just enter into the world. Of, no, no, this is important to, to learn for our community, to start exactly, as you said. Uh, I think that Doug also last year showed us regular expressions, but this was good for starting. And then, <laughs> but in general, your session was technical. But I'm saying that in a good way. We, we love to see also these things. And thank you very much for the material, for the outline, for the exercise, for everything. You have been doing really a great job. So thank you very much, Matteo and Francesco. Thank you. And now our time is over. Thank you. <laughs> we have to go. And so see you next week. Next uh, Thursday, we have a different topic, uh, a digital tool uh, for Mycenaean. So it's a topic that we covered last uh, uh, spring. And now we will be back again on Mycenaean. So thank you very much for this session. And see you next week. And good night to you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.